Hi class, we are now going to discuss on the second part of transfusion medicine. And we are going to discuss on the anticoagulant solutions available as well as the components that you would uh, be able to encounter uh, in the hospital. So the blood preservation entails the use of anticoagulant solutions that would support the metabolic activity of the red cell maintain the anticoagulated state, and minimize the effects of degradation during storage. So we have the base anticoagulant, which is the citrate, and it binds with calcium uh, through chelation, inhibiting calcium-dependent steps of the coagulation cascade. Another base would be the dextrose, which would serve as an energy source for generation of ATP via the glycolytic pathway. So in a blood bag, 63 ml of the 450 ml found in a standard collection volume would be an anticoagulant preservative solution. So maintaining an anticoagulant to blood ratio of 1.4 is to 10. So the first uh, solution that was introduced is called the uh, acid citrate dextrose. So before the onset of this particular solution, they had problems with the sterilization of the solution because dextrose uh, would caramelize during sterilization. And this occurred because of having an alkaline pH. So they solved it in 1943 okay, uh, by Lutit and Mollison. And they added citric acid to the solution, and thus it became acid citrate dextrose. This anticoagulant solution was able to uh, prolong the life of the red cells for 21 days. And then we have the CPD, or the citrate phosphate dextrose which uh, to which they added the inorganic phosphate buffer. It uh, increased the ATP production. It also increased the 2,3-DPG maintenance, which is responsible for the sustained release of oxygen. And it increased the red cell viability. But still, the storage life would be pegged or maintained at 21 days. And then the CPDA1, which is our anticoagulant solution standard uh, for our blood bags here in the Philippines and in other, air, in other countries, uh, this solution added adenine, which provides a substrate for red cells to maximize the APT, ATP synthesis. And this will increase red cell survival. So from 21 days, with the CPD and ACD, the, the shelf life or the storage life for, for blood components with red cells became 35 days from 21 days. We're going to look at this uh, comparison tabulation between day zero of storage to day 35. You can see a difference in uh, the number of or percentage of viable cells that uh, it will go down to more than 20%. The ATP, it decreased uh, by almost half. And this uh, decrease can be associated with a change in the erythrocyte shape and cell rigidity. And that would account for the decrease in viability of the red cells. And 2,3-DPG would decrease by more than 90%. And 2,3-DPG is associated with the release of oxygen to the tissues. So uh, lower levels of 2,3-DPG would cause an increase in the affinity of oxygen for hemoglobin. And this would decrease oxygen release. And potassium levels from uh, day 0 to day 35 would be dramatically increased. As you can see here, from 4.2, it became 27.3. Uh, 4.2 is within the normal 
uh, plasma levels, but 27.3 is uh, very, very high. Uh, but this poses rarely a problem, okay, a clinical problem when we, uh, trans, uh, we, we would transfuse blood products to our patients, except in the setting of a pre-existing hyperkalemia or a renal failure, or if this would be given to very sick neonates. So these uh, changes are what we call as the storage lesions. And um, the only uh, problem that we would see is when we give uh, very old units to pediatric patients okay, or those with renal failure. So now we go to the blood components. So we have the red cell containing components consisting of the whole blood, the packed red blood cell, or we also call it a SPAC RBC. We also have the washed red blood cell or washed RBC. And then the plasma containing components, we have the fresh frozen plasma. We have the cryoprecipitate, the cryosupernate, the platelet concentrate, and the platelet aphoresis concentrate. So how do we prepare the components? So we prepare it through a high-speed centrifugation using a refrigerated centrifuge. Its size would be similar to that of uh, a very large washing machine, uh, or like that of the Maytag, or the whirlpool, okay. and uh, in this recess, you would see the buckets wherein we place the different blood bags. Okay. And through high-speed centrifugation, we are able to separate the red cell, which goes down, okay, with a specific gravity of 1.08 to 1.09, and then we have the platelets, which is 1.03 to 1.04. And lastly would be the plasma, which would be seen on top of the blood component. When we are going to prepare platelets, preferably we have to uh, do it at a 20 to 24 degrees Celsius setting. And it should be done within six hours from uh, collection in order to ensure the viability of the platelets. For the other blood components, we place the temperature setting at one to six degrees Celsius. So there are two types of uh, centrifugation. We have the light spin to, uh, that is to separate the plasma from the red cells. And we peg it at 2000 G. And then the heavy spin is to separate the red blood cells and pack it uh, to produce or separate the platelets or to produce cryoprecipitate from the uh, plasma. And we are going to use 5,000 G for that one. This would be the blood bags that would be available for use. It can be uh, only one bag, okay? That is a single bag or we can have a satellite bag attached to the mother bag. So we call it as a double bag, or we can have two satellite bags attached to it. We call it as the triple bag. Or if you have three satellite bags, we call it as a quadruple bag. So during the course of centrifugation, this is just a, an, a, an illustration of what will happen. Okay, so during uh, the separation of the whole blood, separating it using a light spin that is at 2000 G, we are able to separate the, the plasma from the red cell with the red cell at the bottom. And then we transfer the plasma to another bag that is a satellite bag. And then we perform a heavy spin in order to separate the platelets. And then we transfer uh, the plasma to another satellite bag. And now we have different components. 
this would be very essential uh, in separating them so that we would uh, decrease the incidence of uh, congestion. Okay, and we give only the specific products for certain conditions. So now let's go with the specific blood components, starting with the whole blood. The whole blood, if you are going to uh, do a collection with the different satellite bags, that this would be the unprocessed blood. Or we can simply give it as a single blood bag okay, uh, to our patients. Its volume is 450 ml, and we store it at 1 to 6 degrees Celsius. Its shelf life would depend on the anticoagulant solution that is used. So for CPDA1, it's 35 days. For CPD, it's 21 days. And the, uh, the only indication clinically when we use whole blood is when we have an actively bleeding patient. Uh, and this is defined as a patient who is experiencing more than 150 ml per minute of blood loss or an equivalent of 40 to 50 percent of the entire blood. Okay. So next we have the packed red blood cell. Oh, sorry. So the main indication of the whole blood is to serve primarily as a source material for components. Okay, so sometimes we are given whole blood by the uh, by the by the blood center, but in cases that we are going to use it for elective surgery, we are going to uh, remove the the red cell uh, the, the plasma and run it as a pack RBC. Okay, so speaking of the next blood component. We have the PAC red blood cell or the PAC RBC. And we are going to pre prepare it in two ways, through centrifugation of the whole blood or through overnight sedimentation. So we, sometimes, again, we are given a whole blood and we have uh, plasma included in the whole blood. So what we do is we stand, uh, let it stand okay, in the refrigerator and we wait for uh, a few hours before the red cells would settle down. And then we remove the plasma through this separator. Okay? So in that way, we are we would be able to give the pack red blood cell. Uh, in, in the words, sometimes if the need to uh, need to use the whole blood because the pack red blood cell is not available, they would turn it upside down. Okay, And we let it stand and they are only going to give the, the pack red blood cell. So th they are going to turn it upside down because this would be the site for insertion of the needle. So the red cells would become or would be placed over here and the plasma would be placed on this area. So they're just going to transfuse the red cells, okay? So the PAC RBC, its volume is around 260 ml, maintaining a hematocrit level of 70 to 80%. We are going to leave uh, plasma in the PAC RBC. And one unit of PAC RBC is able to increase the hematocrit by 2 to 9%. Okay. Uh, we store it at 1 to 6 degrees Celsius, and the shelf life, again, would be dependent on the anticoagulant solution. So this would be the uh, protocol or the transfusion guidelines for packed red blood cell transfusion. So if there's symptomatic anemia in a euvolemic patient, if there is an acute blood loss of more than 50% of the estimated blood volume, a preoperative hemoglobin of less than 9 grams per deciliter, and with expected blood loss of more than 500 ml. So this is what the surgeons would follow. Or a hemoglobin of less than 7 in a critically ill patient, 
or a less than 7 uh, grams per deciliter hemoglobin in a non-exsanguinating upper GI bleeding. In a patient with acute coronary syndrome, the hemoglobin is less than 8, or those with hemoglobin of less than 10 presenting with uremic bleeding or thrombocytopenic bleeding. And for sickle cell disease, this would be the qualifications. Okay. So for washed red blood cells, this is a modification of the PAC-RBC. And we wash the red blood cells with isotonic solution or isotonic saline. And uh, the task here is to remove the plasma proteins. The volume is 180 ml. We store it at 1 to 6 degrees Celsius. And because we have removed uh, the plasma, its shelf life becomes 24 hours. What would be the indication of giving wash red blood cell? So usually we have patients who have history of transfusion and had history of a reaction, a febrile transfusion reaction. And this may be due to the presence of, of uh, donor plasma proteins so, or the presence of allergic reaction. So the reason why we give wash red blood cell is to prevent a transfusion reaction like a febrile transfusion reaction or an allergic transfusion reaction. Next, we have the plasma containing derivatives, starting with the fresh frozen plasma. We call it also as an FFP. And this is prepared from single donor, and then we separate the red cells. The, the uh, plasma should be separated within eight hours in order to preserve the labile collection of the labile coagulation factors five and eight. So this is usually, uh, uh, usually we use a double bag with the packed red blood cell and the plasma, or that's the minimum, or we have the quadruple bag. The volume is 200 to 260 ml. And we placed here the recommendation by Henry and the DOH recommendation. Uh, for the DOH recommendation, I'm going to give it to you later. But for Henry's, the recommendation is lower than 18 degrees Celsius. The shelf life is one year. But uh, the moment that we thaw it, it becomes 24 hours uh, expiration for Henry's. But uh, in, the, in our setting, in the Philippine setting, it's six hours after thawing, okay? Okay, so what do you mean by thawing? It's because when we are going to store it, we store it at uh, negative 18 degrees Celsius or more. So it means that it is very, very hard. It is like an ice. So what we do is when you are going to request for a fresh frozen plasma, a cryoprecipitate, or a cryosupernate, you have to give the request or you tell the, the, the ward, the nurses there, to drop off or give the request 30 minutes before, uh, before you're going to use it because we have to thaw the, uh, the, the plasma. Okay, so like thawing a, a frozen product. Okay, so we are going to thaw it 37 degrees Celsius. So what happens if the plasma okay, uh, is not utilized during that time? So it, uh, it may still be used, but we relabel it as thawed plasma. Okay, so we, re we relabel it as thawed plasma. We store it at 1 to 6 degrees Celsius, and we can still use it five days after thawing. However, the labile factors, factors 5 and 8, are uh, markedly reduced already because these are labile factors. Now we go into the plasma transfusion guidelines. So 
So what how uh what are the conditions to which we use FFP? If there's multiple factor uh factor deficiencies of our coagulation factor replace replacement and that is the most common indication uh, how do we know that there's a coagulation factor problem we uh, would request for prothrombin time and the active weighted partial thromboplastin time okay to see whether it's prolonged or not and we also have the dilutional coagulopathy, wherein there's a massive transfusion, like when they are going to perform cabbage procedure, uh, we also have to give plasma in addition to the red cells. Hemorrhage in liver disease, because we know that uh, in liver, in, in the liver, it, is, it supplies the proteins for coagulation factor formation like those who are the, like the vitamin k dependent factors okay and then we have the coumadin reversal we have uh, warf uh, if we have uh, warfarin uh, warfarin use and there's bleeding and then we have the thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and lastly is the acute traumatic resuscitation Next, we have the platelet concentrate to which uh, we're going to uh, derive it from the whole blood. It should be separated within six to eight hours. And we are going to use a triple bag because we're going to remove the platelet from the plasma. Its volume is around 30 to 50 ml and contains around 5.5 times 10 to the six platelets per unit. We store it at room temperature that is 20 to 24 degrees Celsius, and it should be agitated always. Its shelf life is five days, five days only. These are the uh, protocols or guidelines for transfusion of platelets. So thrombocytopenia that is due to a decrease in production. If we have a stable patient, but the platelet count is less than 10,000. So usually we encounter this one in dengue patients. Invasive procedure with a low risk for bleeding and the platelet count is less than 20,000. Uh, if there's a bleeding and invasive procedure with high risk of bleeding, so we increase the platelet count requirement to less than 50,000. If there's a retinal or CNS bleeding or surgery, the platelet count is less than 100,000, or there's microvascular bleeding due to platelet dysfunction. Now, there's another form of a platelet concentrate, which we call as the platelet apheresis concentrate, and we pre prepare it through an apheresis machine like this one. Okay. Uh, and or, uh, for platelet apheresis concentrate, we use only one or utilize one donor, and we are able to get um, an equivalent of six, okay, six platelet concentrates. Okay, so this would be an advantage if we are going to we we need a lot of platelet concentrates uh, for our patient. Uh, the only problem here would be the price because the advantage of getting uh, more donors okay, is that you have a, a less expensive procedure. But the problem here is if you don't have a lot of donors uh, and another problem for platelet apheresis is the money. Okay, So it's it's more expensive. Next, we have the cryoprecipitate, which is sourced from fresh frozen plasma. And um, we get it from the FFP. We have a triple bag that would be used. Its volume is around 10 to 30 ml. And the shelf life is similar to that of fresh frozen plasma wherein we peg it at one year. And we store it at less than 18 degrees Celsius. 
So how do we use it? We thaw it uh, at 37 degrees prior to use. Again, you have to inform the blood bank that you are going to use it 30 minutes prior so that we can prepare for the thawing. Okay? If you, uh, if the nurses won't, uh, won't uh, relay it to us within that time, by the time that you're going to use it, we are still going to thaw it. Okay, so it cannot be refrozen after. Okay, uh, within it should be given within six hours, and we place it at 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. So, what are the contents of a cryoprecipitate? It has fibrinogen factor eight, von Willebrand, and fibronectin. Okay, so uh, an advantage against using a, a fresh frozen plasma versus a cryoprecipitate is if you, you need only the factor eight, then we, you can give more cryoprecipitate, okay? And it reduces the incidence of congestion to the patient. So the indications of, of giving cryoprecipitate would be as follows. We have hemophilia A, that's a factor eight deficiency. You have the von Willebrand disease, a congenital factor 13 deficiency, or an acquired fibrinogen deficiency, or a uremic coagulopathy, wherein there's a uremia with prolonged bleeding time. In acquired fibrinogen deficiency, we, we have this one in hepatocellular uh, diseases. Okay, And our last blood component would be a cryosupernate wherein this is a residual plasma uh, after removal of cryoprecipitate from the fresh frozen plasma. The, whole, the volume is 200 ml and we store it at less than 18 degrees Celsius with a shelf life of one year. So after thawing, it should be stored at one to six degrees Celsius and to be transfused within 24 hours. Its main indication is uh, for thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Uh, however, uh, because of the similar indication as that of the fresh frozen plasma, this is the one that is left behind in our blood bank. So I'll just discuss on the storage time for fresh frozen plasma as recommended by the Department of Health for blood service facilities here in the Philippines. Okay. And, uh, but in uh, other countries, they would follow the Henry's. So the storage temperature, if we're going to store it at negative 20 to 24, to negative 24, the maximum storage time is three months. Negative 25 to negative 29 degrees Celsius, the storage for fresh frozen plasma would be six months. If we store it at negative 32, negative 39 degrees Celsius, it becomes 12 months. And if we store it negative 40 to negative 64, the storage would be 24 months. Negative 65, seven years. Okay, so the storage temperature would matter Okay, when we are going to store fresh frozen plasma products Okay, and other plasma containing derivatives. And lastly, sometimes you would encounter irradiated blood products. This would be done on, con on components that would contain viable lymphocytes. And uh, the presence of these lymphocytes may be the reason for transfusion reactions. So we expose, expose it to a gamma or X-ray with a minimum dose of 25 gray at the center and 15 gray at the periphery. And the expiration for irradiated products would be 14 days. So if we're going to look for a component that, should, that would be for irradiation, it should not be more than 14 days old. So that's our, my last slide. Thank you for listening. I hope that you learned something uh, from, this, uh, from this lecture. Thank you and good day.